pop 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 pop
We'll just see where we go. We'll from just see here. where it goes. We'll see where I, I am here. reminded, and this will be the last I say right now. Uh, probably my favorite thing that's ever happened in the entire history of our podcast is the day we talked about snowballing. So, so this just puts me in mind of that. The, yeah, and I miss that. I, I enjoyed that. You that know what? Riff. I I and I don't want to go back to that. I do not. But I do remember that conversation, and ironically or coincidentally, that exact conversation just like popped into my head today. And the reason why, I actually don't know why, it popped into my head, but I remember thinking, gosh, I can't actually remember what that was. Like, I remember you gave me a very, no, no, wait, Harry, I can see your here's face. Your mistake. No, 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 I can see in your face that you want to tell me. I don't want to know. You but didn't have to say that to me. I know. <laughs> no, but what I was going to say is I self-talked to myself and was like, never tell Tim that you've forgotten what that means. Google it or something if you care but i i don't want to know but yes i this do sound, remember it sounds like you did a really bad job of self talk if it's, that was the story you told yourself because here we are this is true and this goes back to that again that set like if i do think at the root of how i handle anxiety it is through saying what's in my mind out, outside like i'm i'm saying what i'm internally thinking outside so that's that's how i am coping at the hives and saying and oversharing is okay. Is my well, mode. well, of the two of us, you're clearly the one who's oversharing. This, I think that is unambiguously the case. You're clearly the one who has said more uncomfortable things in the last five minutes. I believe that to be entirely true. I also want to know a couple other things. You were gone. Uh, we only could record late in the night tonight because you had a mm. very busy weekend. I want to know why. I hope it hasn't doesn't have to do with fingertips. It's okay no, if but it, it does. has a lot to do with snowballing. It does. Oh, okay. Okay. So. No, no. I have been in Evanston, Illinois, Rob and Mai's old stomping grounds. Um, in fact, uh, not more than, than tens of yards at one point away from the dormitory where Rob and I lived in Evanston. Uh, I have been attending for the first time since 2020, the first time since the pandemic, uh, B-Fest, a 24-hour marathon of bad movies. Ah. Um, which was a particularly special year, not just because it was a return to B-Fest, for me at least from the pandemic, they had it in 2022. I missed it that year. I was unable to attend because of my teaching schedule, but I did get back this year. Uh, and I also had the great privilege of meeting uh, two of our listeners at what? B-Fest, You're Sting kidding. and MC. Oh. Regular, regular appearances on our, our Patreon events as well. So it was a great pleasure to get to to hang out with them and chat with bad movies, chat, chat about bad movies in between the, the bad movies with them. So, so that was a fun experience, but yeah, I, uh, I fried my brain real hard. Uh, this was, as I said, I haven't done this for three years and I got out of the habit. I sort of, it's like when you're, when you were a really good runner in college, mm -hmm. like you were the best runner mm -hmm. and everyone like looked at you and was like, this, this kid knows how to run. And so you just sort of, your internal narrative is like, well, I'm good at running. Yeah. Uh, but then let's say you take five years where you sit on your couch without moving for those five years, you're not a good runner any anymore. Like you, you potentially can train yourself back into being a good runner, but you don't drag your butt off the couch for the first time in all those years and say, all right, well, here goes a, here goes a five minute run or five mile run. Uh, Cause you'll, you'll break yourself. And it's been a, a while. It's been three years since I've had to do that kind of intense film watching uh, and it it really fried me. I I took longer than I expected to recover from it. Honestly, um, my plan, the reason I needed to record so late was not because of this, but it ended up being necessary. Like I just wasn't turned on really until about two hours before we started re recording. My brain just wasn't wasn't clicking over. Uh, Do you have to normally so yes. be turned on to to be on the show? Is that what what it is? I mean, how else would I find all those like avenues for innuendo so quickly if I'm not like razor sharp and focused on on finding every possible double entendre in what you say? Uh, <laughs> but no, so so I, I did get a little a little punchy at the end of those twenty four uh, hours of bad movies, but so it was a good experience. Uh, I ended up watching nine movies, half of a tenth movie, and a short was my sort of list for the 24 hours that's what i was going to ask you so you're so not let's just say at nine movies 
what's the gap in between? Like what, what does it look like? Are you just going like, do you go from room to room or is it like they all show in the same screening? They all show in the same room. It's the, uh, it's a great big, like 450 person auditorium uh, at Northwestern's campus, which is certainly not sold out. Uh, They don't sell all the seats. And this year they actually did not sell all the seats they had. So there's probably about a hundred and, 50 to 180 people in the room, which is still a good size room. But yeah, um, they show a movie. They give you a gap of anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes to pee and drink and recalibrate and do whatever you need to do. Um, and then they start the next movie. And it's that for 24 hours. Wowzers. So, where's the so food grand- coming in? Mm-hmm. Where are the snacks? Where are the food? Where Where's all that? You pack in, you eat during the movie, you eat in those 20 minute breaks whenever, whenever you need it. I had... Uh, I had some power bars. I had some beef jerky. I had obviously a whole bunch of uh, caffeinated beverages. Tried to limit the sugar because I was like, the one thing I knew was my body was not going to want the sugar. Yep. So I, I did not do that. I only did things that were high protein snacks. Uh, still did not escape without having caused some some fairly substantial damage to my GI system, ah, I would say. From... The, the jerky, the jerky ripped you up a little bit or the jerky happened? ripped me up. Just the, the not eating whilst also not sleeping, okay. I think is really what did it. It was yeah. just a sort of one, two punch of don't do this to your body. Yeah. Yeah. I did the same thing over the weekend, a little bit different. Also high protein though. I got some gas station eggs, like gas station, <sighs> oh. hard boiled eggs. And you know what? That didn't go well for me. It didn't. Oh, Carrie. Yeah. <laughs> was a mistake and so i I recommend never doing that what what path through life brought you to the gas station at a moment where you were so hungry that the eggs looked good ah you know what i also was on my way to illinois this weekend we were doing like a screenwriting thing uh with a friend Catherine clark we were doing uh at her house and so i was so determined to be on time that i was just trying to get efficiency so i was like i need to stop and get gas i don't have time to stop and gas i haven't eaten yet today i want to make sure that i have like like something healthy. And so I, when I went in while I was filling up, even though they said, do not leave your gas filler alone. If there's a note, I broke the rule. I ran in as fast as I could and I got those hard boiled eggs because I thought it would be healthy. And I, so you're, so you're saying it was okay. karma for leaving your car unattended. That's what I think. I think it was the, it was the breaking the rule, the lie, whatever it was, was like, I will come back and get you gastrointestinally for the next several hours after these two hard boiled eggs that I ate yep. really quickly. I can, can only conceive. It was problematic. So I have to jump back to something that you said about this. So I know I should be more concerned about the movies that you saw, but I am more concerned about the friends of the show that you saw. Um, and this is not an HR friendly thing for me to say on this podcast, but I have to say MC as a uh, friend of the show and person who joins our watch parties is maybe the most adorable and hilarious commenter slash person just that I've ever met. Was that, did you notice that he was hilarious and adorable in real life? I mean, I will certainly say, I think MC was, it was his first year and he was bolder than I would be. Uh, he made sure, because part of what you do at B-Fest is you sort of like, when you, you're watching bad movies, when you come up with something amusing to say about one of the bad movies, you shout it out. It's basically Mystery Science Theater 3000. Oh, um, okay. But like for, for 180 people rather than for three, and we're all doing improv rather than having a script. So, you know, you have to you have to sort of know what you're going to say. You have to be ready for the riff. And MC was was shouting out riffs at at top volume. Like he was, he was yelling to be heard in that whole space. I rarely even do that now. Like I still usually my riffs are for like the four people around me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so kudos to that. Like that, that takes a lot of guts and I I admire the hell out of it, out of of you for going that way. MC, I think you, you really, you really did us proud. Just diving right into the riffing. Nice. Nice. Uh, that's what I would have expected. Okay. And now my actual movie related question. So you're watching bad movies and i've never been to one of these before is it like new bad movies or is it a compilation of like old bad movies that they're pulling together for everybody to watch the oldest movie we watched was if i recall correctly it was from the 50s i don't think they showed anything earlier than the the 50s this year um i'm trying to remember which ones i didn't sit through because i didn't sit through everything because i did need to sleep uh I think the oldest thing we watched might have been X the Unknown, which is a nuclear paranoia sci-fi movie from the 50s. Hmm. I am pretty confident that the most recent thing we watched was a 
a Japanese comedy that I wouldn't even call a bad movie. I was that would actually say it was quite a good movie, and I will be I will be recommending it to folks. A 2007 film called Big Man Japan, uh, which is about a it's a mockumentary about a guy who, when you zap him with electricity, he turns into a, a giant like guy who can fight giant monsters, but he's not very good at it, and he's kind of this like pathetic sad sack in his life. Uh, and it's a kind of mockumentary about him going about his days and, and punching monsters. Mm. And that was from 2007. So a, a nice, a nice 50 ish year span. Okay. Probably weighted heaviest in the eighties. I'd say. All right. Well that, so you're saying it was good. Are you for the worth mentioning today, which we'll be covering, are you bringing one of these movies or what's your plan? How are you going well, to cover no, for, for worth mentioning, uh, as you, as you roped me in last week without yeah. asking my permission first, uh, I will be, I will be watching a Patreon film. I, I know I love doing that to you because I love that moment when you realize that I'm trapping you and well, that you're I, like I had planned on not recording an episode this weekend at all. I know. See? I know. And then I know if I say it out into the world and I put it into the ether that you feel obligated. So it was kind of mean. I like I recognize that now that it was mean on my part. But at the same time too, I'm really enjoying talking to you. So it's like a selfish okay. and mean thing at the same time that I feel good about, which I don't know what that says about me. It's probably not good. No, I will. I will actually. I'd like to say a couple more words about B Fest movie, but I'll I'll do that in in turn. Uh, but the official movie I'm bringing to our worth mentioning is the 1971 dystopian sci-fi philosophical epic THX 1138, uh, which was probably best known as the debut film of uh, George Lucas as a writer director of features, uh, and that comes to us at the request of our Patreon Tristan Tristan Frailing. Ooh. And did are, you know hmm? anything about this going into it? Did you think it was going to be good? I've seen it before. Oh, you had. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Not, not a new watch for me. Uh, what are you bringing for, for worth mentioning? I don't know. Ah, I'm well, cause like, you, you also verbally committed yourself to one I at know. the end of last episode. I know. And I'm real mad about it. <laughs> so I don't, I don't want to talk about it. No, I do. Thank you. Patreon supporter Zach Ross for your pick this week. Once upon a time, in China. Well, thank you. All right. It was uh, a movie. I I feel like Once Upon a Time in China is going to be very exciting to talk about because I I sometimes think there is a genre of film that our Patreons request for you and Rob. Yeah. Which is the genre of I'm requesting it for Rob and Carrie, but I'll bet Tim will have something to say about it. Yes. And this this feels like one of those. Ha ha, jokes on you, Zach Ross. I haven't seen Once Upon a Time in China, and I forgot until about half an hour ago that that's what you were watching, so yes. I did not do so And this that's week. okay. I think that's okay. I'll tell you about it, and I'll tell you the way I interpreted it. I, I think this is going to go really well, and I'm really excited for it. <laughs> you bet. You bet. And what's probably going to happen is every single listener right now that has seen this movie is going to want to be frankly probably just like removing their ears like you're, you're gonna want to hover your finger over the skip ahead 30 second button for sure for sure like because i actually don't know how to describe this movie in any coherent way and so i'm gonna give it a go but we'll get there and then i also wanted to just five minutes ago i got back from seeing ant-man and the wasp quantum mania and so i thought i'd just give you my thumbs up thumbs down on that if i had a if i had a minute or two is you know is quantum mania how they pronounce it in the film um, I don't know. How would you pronounce it if you were saying it? I would pronounce it quanta mania. Quanta mania. I think it's it's unclear. It's unclear. They didn't actually say quanta mania in the in the movie, so it's unknown at this point. But we'll find out. Okay. okay. So you go first. I think I kind of want to hear about T TMX. Well, how about this? How about I say a little bit about. My B-Fest movie, and then you give oh, us yes. your thumbs up, thumbs down on Ant-Man, and then I'll go into THX. I would love if you would do that. All right. So the movie I want to say just a little bit about from B-Fest is a, uh, a real just bonkers-ass Taiwanese film from 1981 called Thrilling Bloody Sword in English. I don't know whether that's an appropriate translation of the the original title or not. Uh, it is a film directed by Chang Chin Si. Ch I'm sorry, Chin Yi, uh, who is... Um, not a filmmaker I've heard of, certainly, uh, but this movie, which came out in 1981, is a a retelling of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs uh, that feels like like a five season television program that has been compressed into 89 minutes 
and it is a wild ride it is happening so fast like by the 10 minute mark it feels like you've already gotten a full movie's worth of stuff and you like haven't even gotten out of the exposition yet um really really dug it the film was restored not very long ago uh basically as a sort of amateur hobby project by the people at a uh, gold ninja video i don't know if that's the version we watched it looked it looked good ish for what the film is but not so good that i would necessarily assume it was the end result of a restoration attempt um either way film is super great if you are into kung fu movies that move really really fast and are complicated largely because they're moving so fast and also just full of of thrilling bloodiness as mm -hmm. the title promises uh so really really great time i, I thought it was a blast probably not even probably, definitely my favorite film of the festival. Interesting. And it'll be a good pairing because I'm not into anything that you just talked about. But it sounds very similar to another movie that I watched. So I'm excited to tell you about it, too. <laughs> <laughs> so you recommend, what was that one called again? Thrilling Bloody Sword. Thrilling Bloody Sword. If only we had seen that before our episode last week, top five movie titles, it may have made the list. That's a, it may have. That's it a may classic. Indeed. All right. And I, so should I jump to Ant-Man a little bit? Why don't you? And the Quantumana, the Quantumania, uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Okay. So I like Ant-Man. I do like Ant-Man. Um, and it's not because they're ever particularly good. It's honestly, if I'm being really honest, I just have a really big crush on Paul Rudd. And I think we all do. And I think that's I the think, only reason I think most Paul people Rudd like is it. one of those people you have to have a crush on, even if you are the straightest man in the history of straightness. So you agree. You also feel things when you see Paul Rudd. Not even sexual things. Just like, no, like hug don't you things. think that don't you think that if Paul Rudd gave you a hug, it would be a good hug? Yes. yes. Like a real like you'd be telling people about that hug two years later. Days and hug. days. You know what? All right. Let's see if we, let's see if we agree. Do you think he would be an under an over or a cross? I think he'd be a cross. A, a thousand. I, I don't even, I should have written it down on a piece of paper so you know that I'm not lying. I was also going to say a cross. It's like, how can I get as tight as possible into this bear-like situation? And you know what? It's going to linger just a hair longer than it should, but you want it. Like, it's going to mm. be tight. Ah, It's going to be a good one. I feel that too. And I feel like his movies are just that hug for me. Like he's there for me. He's looking me in the eye and I just love, I just love everything about him. So I, if you haven't seen his first movie, you totally should. I think you'd really enjoy it. What is it? Halloween six, the curse of Michael Myers. Oh, is he in that? He for sure is. What does he play? It is for sure. His first movie. It's terrible. And he's bad in it because there's no way to be good in that movie. Ah, but that's where he got to start. It is. All it right. is. A lot of people got their start in slasher movies. Okay. Well, you know what? He it came out like it. six months before Clueless, so just call Clueless his debut and, and feel good about your life. That's true. That's true. I do feel a lot better when I think about that. So he is in this with Evangeline Lilly, as you know, who plays the little bumblebee. Um, Michael Douglas or, is back. Or the wasp even. Oh, you know what? I think she also does that. I think she's like kind of like a dual... She doesn't want to like limit herself on what kind of insect I'm, she is. I'm, just, I'm saying the film has a title and that title is Ant-Man and the Wasp. So yeah, that's fair. That's so fair. there we go. <laughs> now that I'm rereading what's on my paper. Um, Michael Douglas is still alive and is in this movie. Um, <coughs> so is Michelle Pfeiffer. She is the mom. Um, and they're coming out. I double checked with Rob. This is not a spoiler. They're coming out and they're trying to defeat Kang the Conqueror, who was played by Jonathan Majors. Did you That's, know that already? That is the thing that has been front and center in the advertising. Okay, yes. good, good, good. I wanted to be sure. Okay, so about this movie. I saw it five hours ago. I don't actually know what happened. The only thing I really remember was that I really kind of liked Paul Rudd's teeth. I remember really zeroing in on him at one point. Other than that, this whole crew goes back to the quantum realm, and it's honestly like a, I don't even know how long the movie was. It's like a two-hour battle scene for like two hours with some people that they discover in the, in the quantum realm. And it is pretty manic. I can see where the title comes from. There's some mania going on. Other than that, like it was fine. I walked away. The kids were like three and a half stars, which is actually really low for the kids. They gave like cars three, five stars, but um, it was fine. Like we laughed. I didn't think it was overly funny or hilarious, but it was like, it was just fine. I, di I didn't walk away thinking worst two hours of my life. I just kind of walked away being like, meh, good way to like 
get the kids out of the house on a cold day. Okay. So. I mean, isn't isn't a cold day a day you usually leave the kids in the house? Uh, you could. One could do that. But we were trying to get him out, get him, get him out and about. Actually, we were like, let's get him out of the house so we can get some fresh air. And then we got there and like, I don't know, we haven't been to a movie in so long, like in the theaters that we just like binged on Milk Duds and so much popcorn and we left uh, feeling like yes. worse than when we went there. <laughs> like, Love that. Love that. I know. We just pumped the kids full of sugar. So now they're grouchy now that we're home. But Either way, it was it was absolutely fine. Um, and then it was a cute moment because I, I don't did I tell you last week that I ran into Michelle Pfeiffer? Did I tell you that already? I think you did. Yes, I did. Yeah, I'm so, trying to remember. I think you did. I did. I ran into her at the hotel when we were in uh, at Sundance, and uh, I felt like we knew each other then because she was in this movie. It was kind of like, hey, oh, so, that's my buddy Michelle. That's my buddy Michelle. We're friends, you know. Like we made eye contact. Yep, so exactly, it, it felt like a personal movie at this point. But do I do I recommend that you're going to see it, Tim? You are going to give this movie. Two and a half stars. Okay. So, so you're, I'm hearing a thumbs down for me personally, but maybe thumbs sideways, but the sideways is angled up for people in general. Yeah, I think so. I think most people will feel like it's around a three. Like, I think it's okay. middle of the road. It's fine. It's harmless, but nothing that's going to stand out as a memorable Marvel movie in the future. Memorable Marvel movie is a good phrase, and I think you should hang on to it. I will. I will. So. Tell me about tell me about THX DMX. All right, so uh, so it's THX THX, which okay, is, which is which stands for nothing and means nothing, so it's very easy to keep track of it. Uh, THX eleven thirty eight, which um, is reduced from a, a George Lucas film short film with an even longer title, uh, which I believe is I, I wish I had this in front of me right now. I would not be riffing looking for it. Uh, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I'll come up with it. But anyway, THX 1138 is the name of the protagonist of this film, who is played by uh, Robert Duvall in one of his early films. Not his earliest, of course, but but uh, this is a pre-Godfather film, so it's sort of before he had his breakout moment. Uh, and it is set in a dystopian future, time sort of deliberately left unclear, where uh, every human is designated basically by a serial number rather than a name. So THX 1138 is our our main character. Uh, he has a lady roommate named LUH 3417, played by Maggie McOmey, who is not a name that I certainly know outside of the context of this film. Uh, but basically it is in the future where we are just kind of objects in a machine our job is to kind of do tedial, meaningless work, tedious, menial work, uh, engage with whatever electronic stimulation the powers that be are willing to give us and sort of have no personalities or lives of our own. Very, very much a, a sort of deliberate and obvious satire of sort of how we live our lives now, right? Like, you know, we we have too much too much media, we have too much automated jobs we have all of this bullshit that makes it hard for us to feel like people and you know george lucas at the time he wrote directed this film was 25 years old so he, so knew. he hmm. knew it was coming he was anticipating well, where the he, world he, was he, he thought it was here really and that's kind of one of the things about the movie actually um it describes this very complex future world where technology is ridden over everything and everything's computerized but a because it was cheap and b to make a comment on the world man uh everything was shot on location like there's no there are some sets built for this movie but mostly this movie was just shot in like the bay area in 1970 and 1971 and all of these places that were designed to look sort of modernist and hyper futuristic that lucas sort of realized hey if i shoot this from the right angle and light it the right way it'll look like this completely inhumane cold concrete brick of space mm -hmm. So he's basically trying to turn Central California circa 1971 into this dystopian hellscape. Uh, so basically, the plot is sort of immaterial, but uh, LUH, the, the lady who lives with uh, THX, decides she's had enough of this. So she tries to kind of break out and he kind of tries to break out with her. They end up uh, encountering another nameless person whose name is uh, S.E.N., played by Donald Pleasance, who was a little bit more established, I'd say, at this point than Robert Duvall. Uh, and Donald Pleasance sort of joins THX in this, you know, 
attempt to escape through these these catacombs and dystopian whatnots. Uh, mostly, though, the film I'd say is this kind of it's a mood, right? Like the the movie is very much about creating these unpleasant gray spaces. Uh, creating this kind of visual sense of like a place where humanity is not allowed to exist. And that's where a lot of, um, a lot of really the the commentary and the satire that Lucas is interested in, he's sort of teasing it out of how he's shooting things. Uh, it also had a very, very important sound mix. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to quickly scrounge up who actually did. Oh, of course it was Walter Murch, who of is course. one of like the great sound designers who's ever lived. Uh, and this was probably one to be one of his first big deals. He is sort of best known for um, uh, doing the sound work in Apocalypse Now. But this is earlier in his career than that. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola, actually, who would later direct The Godfather and Apocalypse Now, produced this film. Uh, Merch co-wrote it. So it's like this very Bay Area filmmakers circa 1970 who are about to blow up and become super important people all kind of pooled their talents on this. <laughs> excuse me uh but the sound mix as i was saying uh walter merch's sound mix here is full of all these like strange metallic whizzes and whirs that kind of create this like constant montage where the whole movie just feels like it's droning and droning is sort of this very go-to way to make things feel uncomfortable and, and mechanical and, and hard to sort of sit and listen to now the disappointing thing about all this is that in 2004 drunk with the success of the star wars uh special edition re-releases and the star wars prequel trilogy uh george lucas went in and and tinkered with this movie mm. he added cgi backgrounds he uh, com he did a completely new sound mix unfortunately he he changed a oh i don't know what it would have been originally probably 2.0 sound mix to a 5.1 stereo mix and uh and sort of sucked the guts out of his movie. So, so my position walking into this screening, I saw the movie uh, my freshman year of college and loved it. I thought it was superb. It's a it's a movie for a college mindset. Like the whole thing is very like the world's shit, man, and the and the powers that be just want you to like consume their stuff and do what they want you to do, man. And you know George Lucas is twenty five, so like that's forgivable. I'm nineteen at the point I see this movie, so that's I think. Fine. I don't, I don't, I'm not embarrassed that I love this movie as much as I did, but I graduate college in 2004. 2004 is the exact same year that George Lucas decides to fuck with this movie. Uh, and basically since 2004, it has been essentially impossible to lay hands, at least in the legal way on a copy of this movie that, that looks the way it did huh. in, in its 1977 re-release really. Interesting. So you watched and, what did you, when you watched it this time? Did you watch then the CGI? I finally watched the time? CGI special edition. I I could not. I looked uh, tragically. So we live in a world where Star Wars, which of course has also been digitally tinkered with uh, many times, Star Wars fans are are very big entitled nerds, and so there's been like a subculture of hey, let's let's fix Star Wars. Like, let's take all of his stuff back out, but still leave a really polished, pristine looking version. So it's actually fairly easy if you're willing to sort of wade into to illegalities to find versions of Star Wars that are exactly the way it would have looked in 1977 and and look really nice. Right. Like way better than the VHS tapes uh, that that fandom has not accrued to THX 1138. So to my knowledge, there's no way to actually find a unfucked with version more recent than the VHS tapes that would have been released in the 1990s. So I did watch the CGI version, the version with the new sound mix. And I was, I was still into the movie, but those elements of it felt wrong. Cause part of what I think is so great about this movie is that he's like, he's just filming these industrial spaces in the Bay area and making them look like a dystopia if he is going to take CGI and like paint CGI factory spaces over these like blank white walls, he's kind of ruining it a little bit because it's no longer about 1971. Now it's about whatever sort of future world he's trying to create. And the film really is about 1971. I mean, again, it's a commentary on media consumption and sort of mindless work. Um, and I do think it's very good at that. I think that the 25 year old George Lucas, before he had had 
sort of the the taste for money that would happen when you make star wars and become very suddenly very wealthy uh i think he he was a he was a nerdy art film student like i've seen the original short that this is based on uh which for the record i did scrounge up its name its original name was electronic labyrinth thx 1138 4 ed mm. I've seen that. I've also seen his uh, his anti-fascism short Freiheit from 1966. So he's making these like really, really strange little experimental films as a student, as a you know film student in the 60s. So he's got that in him, and he wants to make a feature version of that with THX. So it is really, it is about how it's shot and how it sounds and the sort of the sense of just uncomfortableness. Like it's an uncomfortable movie to watch. It's a movie that's very much designed to make you feel sort of like, this is not, this is not for people. Yeah. Like I'm looking at a movie that's not for people. It's, it's, it's for machines and people are being wedged into it. Um, And I like that about it. I think that still works. I think that as a film student and as a young adult, he had a really keen eye. Like he knew how movies worked. Uh, Story-wise, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a little trite. It Can't sounds, lie. I mean, he's 25. You're like 25. He's, 20, you're he's like, 25. Yeah. I mean, do, you're like, what would we have written at 25? Like, uh, I, I don't think we would be able to. I mean, I wrote a novel of such penetrating insight that I still refuse to have it published for fear that it will just like destroy your ability to even comprehend society. Are you serious? But, uh, no. Oh. I wrote, I, <laughs> I wrote a shitty novel. I would that love to I don't even think it. I have a copy of anymore. Oh. Oh, I would love to read your shitty novel. Um, so question on this though, did you feel like, okay, on bias, like you, you like George Lucas probably because of the Star Wars movies, whatever. If you looked at that movie in a vacuum, like you saw that movie when it was made back when he was 25, yeah. all of that, would you have known what his potential was from this movie? Would you have said, this is a person who's going to go out and just be wildly successful as a Absolutely director? not. You would never be able to see Star Wars from huh. THX 1138. He's making, it's a completely different kind of movie. I think you could sort of see American Graffiti, okay. which was also a pretty big hit. But um, no, this movie tanked. It did very poorly at the box office in 1971. And I don't want to say rightfully so, because I think it's good it's not mainstream. Like it's, it's not a fun movie to watch in a way that star Wars, of course, is one of the most fun movies to watch that's ever been made. Uh, and I, I don't think you would, you would predict that. Like, I feel like if it's 1977 and I've only seen American graffiti and THX 1138, I don't think I would be prepared for star Wars. I think I would be very confused by why the guy who made those two movies has suddenly made this movie. Yeah. That I always wonder how people make that jump. You know, like, how do you go from, and probably a lot of it's money, you know, like if you get a lot of money behind it and a huge team that helps support it and all of that, it's not just one person versus like these more independent films that people do when they are super young and have no money are much smaller teams of people and skill sets and all of that. So maybe and, it's And a, to be fair, THX had a very good small group of people like Walter Murch was involved. Um, Marsha Lucas, who I don't even know if they were married yet, uh, was involved in editing it. And she would go on to edit Star Wars itself. Uh, the score was by Lalo Schifrin, who had done the Mission Impossible theme and had done some other really great stuff. So it has like, it has good people involved, but a lot of them were good people who were like 25. Right. Also right? Poor, who had made their careers, careers good people. Yet. Yeah. Huh. I'm like a little tiny bit intrigued. Like I, when you're talking about it, I'm picturing a little bit of like a Wally -E thing. If Wally -E was a punishingly arty slow movie okay. that was not fun to watch it's it's also very slow that's the thing like he's trying to get at the sense of like their life is this crushing mediocre bore because that's what's being allowed for them so he's making a film it's only 88 minutes long and it's very longest cut which is the 2004 version uh it feels longer than 88 minutes okay it feels a ton <laughs> longer than 88 minutes okay and i i will say i don't know i don't remember because again the last time i saw this film would have been 2001 so that's a long time for specific memories. Uh, the version I saw opens with a brief snippet of stock footage from the Buck Rogers serial. And Buck Rogers is one of the things that directly fed into Star Wars. So I guess in that sense, assuming that that, that prologue, that Buck Rogers sequence existed prior to 2004, 
and I don't remember if it did or not. Uh, that would be one of the things that I think you might realize. Oh, he actually does have like some sense of of classic swashbuckling star, uh, science fiction. Okay. So maybe in that sense, you can see Star Wars from this. Point. I have never had Buck Rogers cereal. Is that like um, like raisins? Is it chocolate? Like what? What is a Buck Rogers cereal like? Like what does that include? It, it has marshmallows and funny shapes. Oh, okay. So do, did it rip off from Lucky Charm? Well, who came first? Lucky C- Charm cereal, as in serialized narrative. Okay. S- okay. Different, different kind of cereal. Different, different kind of cereal. cereal. <laughs> like, like, remember that podcast cereal? Yeah. Like that. That kind of cereal. Oh, man. Buck Rogers is a good name for a cereal, though. I thought it was kind of like Captain great. Crunch. I thought you were going to say it had berries, like like dried berries Entirely in it. Entirely possible there was some sort of food tie into Buck Rogers. I would not say that there was not or could not be. Well, darn. I thought I had a really good pull there, but I did not. Uh, I, I regret to say that you I regret not. to say I am still who I am. Um... For what it's worth, I would have, as a child, eaten a bowl of Buck Rogers cereal. Same, same. And thank you for that. I feel a little less embarrassed now <laughs> knowing that. Um, and on that note, speaking of being embarrassed, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the movie I watched. Um, that I what, think... Was it embarrassing because it was very sexy? I don't know, Tim. I don't know. You don't know if it was very sexy? It was a little sexy. I'll get there. I don't know. I'm going to start off by saying thank you. Thank you to Zach Ross, who is the Patreon subscriber, who requested Once Upon a Time. You're you're making me look bad. I should should end by thanking Tristan again for letting me revisit this film. Still a great time, even even with with George Lucas's CGI goo dripping all over it. Yeah, so this is where you should. I wanted to be. I was starting nice because it's gonna, it's gonna fizzle from there. I'm gonna start at, at the peak and I'm gonna fizzle from there a little bit. So I, let me just compose myself. I had high hopes for this movie. I'm gonna be really honest. I had high hopes. I had no idea what it was about, but I was like, what if it's like, I don't know. Well, it's about China. It's about China, which I was, that was good. I was fine, fine with that. I thought maybe it was going to be like a cute little comedy where like people are running around China and it's a little bit of a whodunit or like, a, I don't know. I thought, I just thought it was going to be something different. Well, I, I know that it's an action film. It is. That, is. that is the thing I know about it. It is. And I'm not a huge action person. So it's a little bit of a genre mashup. So I'm going to tell you, let, let's see if this sells you on this, Tim. So I would say that this movie is a little bit in the mood for love. Okay. okay. Meets what is that movie? And I cannot think of it for the life of me. It was also a Patreon movie. It was a two part series where there's this giant war with a million men from Japan running around in outfits and they're killing each other. And it was two part series. Do you a remember? Two part series about men from Japan running around in outfits killing and each you other. You love them. And we had to watch it. It was like a two parts. It was like a war movie. There were like two war movies and it was just like the worst. Do you remember? The, no one had to watch the run. human condition, did they? No, it was like run and ran or run. Oh yeah. Ron and Kagamusha. Well, that was, that was two different movies. It's not really two parter. Run and ran. I don't Ra- know. Ra- Ron and Kagamusha. Thank you. So it was run and Kagamusha meets in the mood for love meets a little bit before sunset. It's in there. And then I would say there's like just a little smidgen of blazing saddles in here. Maybe. What element of Blazing Saddles? Um, I think the comedy. I think there okay. are little touches of comedy where it's like physical comedy. So it's like that can't happen. There's like a guy cruising up a cruising up a rope, but like you can't do that. Like the physics of the way that he's cruising up the rope. He's like he's running along the rope, but the rope's dangly and it's not it's not taut. He wouldn't be able to run up that rope. So it's like he just scampers. People are just scampering around everywhere in unrealistic ways, kind of like Blazing Saddles. I mean, I I don't remember that element <laughs> of Blazing Saddles, but I will but, I will certainly trust you that that sort of notably physically impossible gags are part of it. I don't even uh, know if that's true. Maybe I, maybe I re- mostly out. remember the racism satire. Oh, when I think of Blazing Saddles, sure. And actually, that's probably in here too. That's probably in here too. I don't know. So I'll tell you what it's about. Let me, let me see if I can sell you on it. So well, I will say you've already sold me on it. You're in, you're in. In, in the mood for love plus Ron sold me on it. And the rest is just so far just been icing. Okay. That's then that's what it is. So there's this person in here. Gosh, he is a cutie. His name's Jet, Jet Lai. Jet, he, Jet Lee. 
Jet Li. Jet Li. I'm I'm familiar with the works of Jet Li. So Jet Li is the main character in this. Have you seen him in anything else? He is one of the most famous stars of of his generation of Chinese language action cinema. Okay. Would I have seen him in anything else? I kind of assume you have, actually. And let me let me see if I can figure that out while you are Kurt, well, you continue to tell us what that cutie pie Jet Li is up <laughs> to in this particular movie. He's a picture. real cutie pie. So he's in this. His name is Wong in this. And then he is counter to Rosamund Kwan, who her name in this is 13th Ant. Like, yeah. So her name is 13th Ant. They're not related. Okay. Let me just try. So she, she is not his 13th aunt. No. And she's into him, and I think he's a little into her. Okay. But he feels like he's supposed to be protecting her, and she kind of wants to, I think she wants to make out. But she feels weird because she's still selling me. I'm still on board. She's still, she's still in, but she keeps trying to tell him like, hey, we're not related. I'm your 13th aunt, but it's like the way that we structure our conversations about people. I'm not really your aunt. She tries to like keep reminding him of that. So there's just a little bit of that in the mood for love vibe. There's, there's something going on there. Um, But it's basically set in the 19th century and it depicts this martial arts hero, Jet Li, who comes through and he's coming against the forces of a bunch of different people, the English, the French, there's Americans. Everyone's trying to like go after China for all their crap. They like are going after China. So they're trying to like fight them off. And then it becomes this like thing about like, can modern uh, warfare like overtake Kung Fu or is Kung Fu better? Like are guns better or is Kung Fu better? And I think we all know the answer to that, that it's Kung Fu. So, I mean, I mean, I've seen, I feel like that's the plot of at least a third of all Kung Fu movies and Kung Fu invariably wins, which does not seem likely to me, but it's, that's why I love movies. This is why I love movies. I, so, but that's the thing about this movie for me. And this is where I would love your perspective on it when you do watch it. It just sort of feels a little bit like before sunrise where it's like, it's just kind of wandering from fight to fight to fight. And you're kind of lose sight of like who are you fighting now like I don't even really know so the only grounding force in it for me was the 13th ant and Jet Li and Wong like wanting them to make out like that's what kept me hooked in this movie I mean to me, that, that's what cinema is, is is seeing cute people that you want to make out yeah and they, they won't do it because if they did then you'd be like okay they made out and you'd stop watching so as long as they continue not making out you continue watching to see if they're going to yeah and that is honestly the only reason I kept watching and that's <laughs> That's the truth. I mean, there's violence everywhere. It, the violence happens in like funny ways where I kept being like, I love, I do like martial arts movies where the, where they're like, wow, like a movie like, um, what's that one where that guy, like, oh gosh, he is such a good martial artist and he gets into like the bathroom and then kills them in the bathroom stall. Remember? Um, I can think of multiple movies where someone gets killed in a bathroom stall. Are you thinking of the raid two? Yes. That's exactly okay. what I'm thinking of. Like, that is so cool because it's like real. Like in this, the martial arts that they're doing feels very like goofy and silly and all over the place. So I don't know how much of it's real versus like, I don't know. Just kind Oh, it's of, all real. They didn't have the money for visual effects in Hong Kong in the 1990s. Well, then you're going to have to watch it. I don't think that they can move in this way. They're all just hopping I mean, around they're, and they're bouncing probably, everywhere. They're probably on wires. They might be. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. They might be on wire. So they're just kind of dancing around and everyone's fighting everybody. There's a couple like rough scenes where like someone tries to go after Rosamond that's not Wong and that gets a little upsetting. But then they come in. Wong saves the day. It's just I don't know. For me, this all like kind of like blurs into together with like just a bunch of dudes just really yelling at each other in really like irritating ways. They're just like just like chirping at each other the whole time. And it's just my misophonia couldn't handle it. Like I just, <laughs> I just was like, I gotta, I gotta be done with this movie. I can't handle arguing. Okay. I, I will say, even though it was not your intent to do so, you sold me hard on this film. Oh, good. Good, good, good. <laughs> I was uh, going to say, do it I is like a film it? that's, that's very much been on my, my radar. Um, it's, it's a big deal movie. It actually won the uh, Hong Kong equivalent of the best director Oscar. Oh, for its sweetheart. And it was nominated for the equivalent of best picture. Interesting. See, that's why I, I even watched this and was like, am I missing something? Is this really good? And I just don't know it. And then 
I said to myself when it was over, do I like this movie? No. Would I ever recommend this movie to somebody? Also, no. So okay, I just... Well, well, even though you haven't recommended it to me, I will take this as a recommendation. Okay. Well, that's good. You'll like a couple of the stunts that are in here. I will say there's a couple stunt elements that I really like. There's one with an a umbrella that happens where he basically like takes down a room with an umbrella. And that works for me. I like that that kind of warfare with... Um, Umbrella-based warfare. Umbrella-based warfare. And that worked for me too. But beyond that... It's uh, this one is not not made not made for the casual movie goer at this time, but but I do appreciate the request. And now, Tim, I do feel good about the fact that you were going to watch it and appreciate it. I, I I look forward to seeing it. Um, I will ask you since I I've been trying to determine which of the which of the filmography of Mr. Lee are you likely to have seen, and I think the answer is not a ton because he's mostly worked in Hong Kong, but he has done a few English films, and I'm I'm just assuming. Anything you've seen of his would have been one of his English films. Uh, did you ever see Lethal Weapon 4? No, I haven't even seen Lethal Weapon 1. I <laughs> Isn't that the worst? I don't know if I think you should. I think that there might be a time and a place where you need to have seen it. And I think at your age in the 2020s. It's past. I think the window might be might be closed okay. for you to really, for you to enjoy Lethal Weapon 1. Uh, have you seen Romeo Must Die? Also No. Have you seen The One from 2001? I kind of want to say yes, just so that you could asking me, because I don't think <laughs> I've seen him in anything. I think I would remember somebody named Jet. I'm like, that's like the coolest ha- name Have you ever. seen any of the Expendables films? No. Have you seen the third, The Mummy, the one that uh, uh, <sighs> Rachel Weisz was replaced by Maria Bello? No, but I did see the first Mummy. I feel okay. good about that. Here we go. And I wanted to go through all those because I I just was curious. But this one, I think you might have. Okay. Did you see the 2020 live action remake of Mulan? You know, I want to say that I did, but I didn't. I've I've played it at my house, but I was like in a weird hosting mode. We were hosting a bunch of people and I was really worried about the snacks and that like there weren't enough snacks. So I was like- I would like to- Guarantee that if you were in the kitchen making snacks, your time was better spent than it would have been if you had actually sat and watched the 2020 Mulan. But he is in the in the 2020 okay. Mulan. He plays the Emperor of China. Okay, okay. Well, I you know what I'm gonna check him out. Check him. Check him out. Um, I do really like uh his name, so I'm gonna just check him out. And I do like martial arts, so I'm like I I'll give him a chance. It's, it sounds like you might not. I know. <laughs> It's like, I want to, I want to so badly. Well, I I would say if you do want to see him do martial arts, you might consider a film from 1992 that he starred in. Okay. Has a very good reputation. Okay. Called Once Upon a Time in China Part Two. Okay. I will think about it. And thank you for that. And thank you, Zach, again. I, uh think those were the those were the ones that I wanted to run through and I am glad that we pushed through for this episode this week Tim because I'm leaving this week and I should let you know I may not be back ever are they are they going to see what's up with your dead brain finally <sighs> no I'm going on a girl's trip this weekend and um are, are you expecting it to be some sort of like like thriller dark comedy situation where one of you is going to end up dead I I think that might happen. Like, I really think that might happen. So I, gosh, I'm just like the old married lady. And I have, I'm going with uh, two of my very on the prowl friends. And what's going to happen, I think, is that like, there's going to be some circumstance where they start to make me uncomfortable, where they're like, we're going to like, stay out past 10. And like, we're gonna go to this place. And I'll probably going to be like, I'm just going to Uber home. And then that's where it's going to all go down. Like I'm the Uber is going to take me into the Everglades and it's just it's all done so the thing is the thing is though it's never the the married lady who ends up dead she's the one who ends up sort of looking like she's the one who did the killing oh and then and then the story is about how you have to get out from that without letting Rob know what's going on because because you also not that you did anything but it certainly looks like you had like very I hot sex with a man oh who was not your i see i see but that's, i didn't that's how right? it works i didn't do it though right you, you didn't you didn't oh, okay. uh like like they hire a stripper and you're like I, this is not for me and then you leave the room and the strippers found like like bisected <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> in an alley several hours later. Yeah. And somehow your fingerprints are all over his yes. thong yes. because the thong was on your bedroom knob and you were like, ew, gross. And you grab the thong and you ball it up and you throw it away. Yeah. But you're the only one who touched the thong. Oh, I won't do that then. I'm not going to touch the thong. I okay. actually am like really, really weirded out by dirty underwear in general. So I don't think I would do that. Even just instinctually, I think I would leave the underwear on the door handle just because I feel like it's been places. Like, so, so I'm know. curious, in the hypothetical situation, yes, very hypothetical, where you are attending a a, a, a male exotic dancer. Yes. And he's he's gyrating, his hips I'm are going, he's, he's, he's Wait, pivoting you... in all the places that one pivots. <laughs> um, what was that? I'm attending him. I don't even know what that means. What am I attending? He's he's giving a show, and you are you are in attendance. I'm sitting there. Okay, okay. You're sitting there. Okay. Uh, but he's he's you know he's got everything going on, and and as this is the custom of the country, uh, one one tucks their payment in appreciation for his his dancing sure. into the waistband of his. His uh, his bikini briefs, his song, yes. whatever, whatever piece of undergarment he happens to be wearing. Yeah. Uh, would you be able to touch dirty underwear such that you would tuck a one dollar bill into the <sighs> the rubber band of of a stripper's uh, waistline? You know, I think I could do I could do waistline. I just don't really want to get anywhere near like the the back string. Like I just don't really. But the front like- you'd be fine with. If, um, I so think, if you have to give his his balls a good jiggle to like tuck the 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 paper there like <laughs> under his taint, you would do that. No, oh, I would. That's the thing. That's what I was getting at. I don't want to touch anything that's such the, the taint. I don't want to touch anything that's such that. I would only. I touch, love that you couldn't say it loud. <laughs> is, is perineum a more comfortable word for you? I gonna see, no, that's not either. I'm gonna try to edit it out. That's why I had to whisper it. Um, I. The, like if it was around the string around the hip, I could tuck a dollar there. I could tuck a dollar there. But okay. um, I have, have you ever been to a male strip club before? I've never been to any strip club of any gender. Oh, so I have. And I got to tell you, I'm the last person you want to go with. I am. I mean, I'm the last fun. person who wants to go. So it sounds like you and I should make a date of it. Uh, yeah, we would just, you and I would just be sitting there like, drinking our overly sugared drinks in the corner, feeling very... Oh, I wouldn't put anything in my mouth that came out of one of those places. My <laughs> Lord, what's wrong with you? I've been to like a couple that were like, not a couple. I've been like, a. I, there was a phase of our life. Everybody had to go like 10 years ago. We all had to go. But I remember feeling... Um, very like I'm gonna I'm gonna cruise into this place and I'm cool like because I'm fine with nudity it's fine on other people like it's fine it's just a butt like whatever and I remember going in and I was like ooh I'm like immediately uncomfortable like in the sense of like wanting to like figure out like the room and just like what to do in the etiquette like I just didn't know what I was doing and then there upstairs there was like a just male only one and that was so much worse so much worse because wait there was there was a co-ed strip club yeah who is the clientele for such a place I mean I was there it's not good I I don't know I mean everybody knew I didn't belong there like clearly I was probably like wearing like a sweater and khakis I mean like I don't even know I was not prepared in any way to actually go to this place but yeah so women were downstairs and then there was like a man one upstairs and so I was like oh my gosh I guess I'm trying to think if I knew Rob at the time I don't know this may have even been pre-Rob I think it was um and there was like a man one upstairs and the the thing that was like the guy upstairs would like call <laughs> so weird he like would come out and he was like wearing just like a like almost what you would like wash your hands with like a little hand drying towel and then he's got that like tucked into exactly what you're saying into those little like strings and then i was like okay keep the towel in place just like cave the towel like no one wants to see what's underneath the towel it's not like great no one wants to see it but we lingered too long and then like, yeah, they remove the towel and then there's this sort of like swinging situation that happens and then you're like, you just, you just want to leave. So he did come up to me hoping that he could have a dollar, but I was saving my dollar. So I just like, I, I kept it. I didn't put my dollar. I wanted to give it down to it like a lady I had seen earlier that I felt bad for downstairs. So I needed to save my dollar, but you would hate it. You would think it was the worst experience of your life. I, I've been invited to strip clubs, none where you could see both ladies and men da- dancing simultaneously, which sounds like it would fry my brain even harder than my, my beefest weekend did. Um, 
I've been invited. I've always politely declined because I would, I would feel, you know, that thing where like a fox gets its arm caught in a trap mm -hmm. and it chews off its own arm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how I'd feel being in one of those places. I yeah. would chew off my own arm to get out of it. Yeah. That's basically what I did. And again, I like not a person anybody wants to go to either. Cause I'm just like a worry wart. So the whole time I'm just like, do you, do you think they feel okay? Do you think they want to be here? Like I'm asking all these questions and no one wants that. Like the downer. The, well, cause the they mist. don't, no one does that cause they want to. No one's so. dream growing up is I'm going to dance in a strip <laughs> I club. Think some people's it. Again, we live in a different world. People can do whatever they want to do. People, but. people can do whatever they want to do. But I, at the same time, I, I would like them to make the more money and keep more of their dignity from having a real job. Oh, yeah. If if the crushing forces of capitalism had not forced them into this. These 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 are the questions that we all ask ourselves. So that could be what happens this weekend. So if I don't see you again because I do end up like getting framed for a stripper's death, I want you to know that I've enjoyed our time together. I also will be sending you photos. We've rented a car uh together while we're down there in Florida and it is a Jeep and it is pink. Um, and I just don't think anything good can come of that either. There is a pink Jeep in Florida <laughs> and you'll be tooling around. The in it. only one, uh, to celebrate, uh, some impending 40th birthdays that are coming up. So you have to go with a peep, uh, a, a Jeep that is pink. Do you, do you know how I celebrated my 40th birthday, Carrie? With me at, uh, seeing Avatar 2. That was, that was my 41st birthday, Carrie. Oh, your 40th birthday. My 40th yes. birthday I spent going to, uh, to the house on the rock. Oh, <laughs> And I, I looked at the Santas because they do Santas there in December. I that that seems a little risque, but I'm glad you I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm just saying some some of us go on road trips where we expect to end up dead or with the blood of a hooker on our hands. Some of us go to see uh, kitschy tourist traps with Santas. I know we all make our own choices. We, we all make choices. We all make choices. Saying. But I have loved working with you all of these years, and I am already looking forward to coming back and telling you the uh, madness that will ensue. So for everybody, excellent. everybody listening, thank you for joining us and our antics go out. You can like us on social media, go out to our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, alternate ending.com to follow us there. And you can go out and leave us a review on iTunes. Maybe not after this episode, you might not want to, but other episodes you can, and we will hopefully be back next week and catch you then. 